Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have Rick Bayan, who's one of the top direct response marketers. He's an award-winning advertising copywriter and author whose works include the popular business reference book. If you haven't heard of it, you have to get it. Words that sell. It sold over 300,000 copies, probably using the same tactics and things that he has in the book, and which we'll hear about. And his advertising has energized the marketing efforts of two established companies and helped in periods of explosive growth. He also wrote more words that sell, the Cynics Dictionary, and extremely dark chocolates. So we'll get a glimpse into his dark humor, which from looking at you, you don't seem like a dark humor, but we hear about it. Rick, thanks for joining me. Glad to be here. With Inspired Insider, I always ask about your lowest moment uh, and how you pushed forward through it, the tough times. Um, yeah, personally, I'd say it was back in 2008 where it was uh, uh, just a series of calamities one after another. Uh, first of all, there was this, this, well, let's see, what came first? Oh, my wife left me first. Uh, wow. had, my son wasn't even four years old at that point, and I, I was just, yeah, just, I just like, oh my gosh, I can't That's devastating. happening. Yeah, yeah, we're still friends. Uh, and I mean, I can understand why she left. Um, you know, she had kind of really special needs. Uh, and, um, we, and you know, she, you know there, there was you know, the difference of personalities. I mean, we, we clicked in terms of chemistry, but yeah, it just didn't work out for her, and so so she left. Um, and then let's see, I couldn't get my essays published. That that was around the time I was submitting those essays, and I was, it was starting to dawn on me that oh my gosh, after my brilliant start with the Cynics Dictionary, it looks like it's going to come to a halt. You know, right here. And then on top of that, then there was the crash of 2008. I lost half my nest egg, which I was depending on. And so anyway, what got me through it was, well, partly my sense of humor, that, that, that helped. And yeah, having a delightful young son who, who lived with me half the time, that, that, that definitely helped too. But I compared myself to this Armenian artist, uh, Arshil Gorky. Uh, he was uh, an abstract expressionist, uh, you know, worked during the 1930s and 40s. He had the most terrible year of anybody I've ever come across. Uh, he was in an auto accident that paralyzed his painting arm. Mm -hmm. He started becoming ill-tempered after that, so his wife left him. Um, he was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And then to top it off, his studio burned down, destroying all his recent work. And he finally hung himself. But I thought, Jeez. you know, you, you have to compare. My year wasn't anywhere as bad as his, so I, I can I can get through it. So. That is dark. That is a dark, yeah. <laughs> dark humor. Yeah. <laughs> I hope that's in your essays. You know, I I haven't brought that up here. That that would be a good one. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's all. Of that's devastating. It, yeah, and there was also a great Swedish movie from, I think, the 1980s. It was called My Life as a Dog, about a little boy who uh, his mother is dying and he gets shipped to stay with relatives. Uh, and they're just, you know, again, he has some, a miserable time. His, his dog is taken from him and probably put to sleep. He's not sure if the dog is still alive. And yeah, he says, you always have to compare. Once I heard about this guy who was walking across the, across the stadium and got a javelin through his chest, you know. Oh, <laughs> you, you always have to compare. <laughs> I think you're one of the only people who could say that, and it makes me smile rather than yeah. like want to cry. I don't know. Why. Yeah. Um, so on the flip side, Rick, yeah. what's been uh, one of the proudest moments? Well, aside from having the Cynics Dictionary accepted for publication, that really, I mean, I wasn't expecting such quick results. I mean, I knew it was a pretty good book, but yeah, yeah when I heard it was accepted by, uh, you know, mainstream, you know, New York publisher, I thought, wow, that's, you know, that's fantastic. Uh, I remember my, my, my colleague stormed out of the room when she heard about it. Why? She was, she was an aspiring author herself and hadn't had such luck. So. <laughs> um. And I've had other high moments too. Um, well, let's see. When uh, I was working at Daytimers, we had hired a new president. He uh, was making the rounds in the building, came into my office and said, Oh, I see you have a copy of Words That Sell on your desk. That's one of my favorite books. <laughs> 
That's so uh, that made me feel good. Yeah, uh, that, that was a really that, was, that the book was really established. Yeah, I love that. And yeah. uh, then to one of my uh, the one of the projects I'm proudest of was actually it was a pro bono project that I did again while I was still working at Daytimers. Uh, there was a local theater in Allentown that used to show quality movies, uh, you know, independent films, foreign films, and so on. And uh, they they were about to go under. They, you know, I'd go there and there would be like, you know, 15 people in the audience. And so the head of the theater got a group of people together and said, okay, we really have to start promoting this film program. And so I volunteered to write their annual uh, membership mailings, uh, which I did. And, you know, it was something, there was advertising I could really get into because I was personally invested in. I loved that, that theater. And, uh, it worked. I, you know, every year our membership went up. Uh, every year I was associated with the program. What'd you do? And there, there's, there's, huh? What did you do with the program? What'd what did you do I for do? them? Yeah. Oh, well, I, used to, I used to write the membership mailings. I was also on their film selection committee. Uh, but yeah, I was, I was considered membership chairman. This is the only advertising I've ever written where I got to sign my own name. Really. <laughs> Yeah, I'd, I'd write the letters and yeah, you know, I'd sign my name to them. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's it, it's fitting because they really were personal letters. I I, you know, I really wanted that place to survive, and it, it did. So. What did you put in there that uh, you think made it do so well? Uh, I think getting people to experience what it's like in the theater, and yeah, most of them knew it, were familiar with it, but I think it needed to be brought home. You know, you, you take your seat in the theater, you look around at the old Art Deco, you know, carvings on the walls, and you sit back and, you know, watch a film that you can't see at the local Cineplex, uh, you know, that, that, that kind of thing, and that, you know, we, we need your support to survive. So, yeah, it's, it, was, it was a lost cause, but, uh, yeah, we managed to rescue it. So... Rick, what's some of your best advice for people out there writing copy? They want to improve their sales messages. What words of uh, advice do you have for them? Um, well, I, again, I use my old colleague's advice, you know, appeal to people's emotions. Um, it, it also, also depends on whether you're an entrepreneur and you're, you know, writing for your own company or whether you're a hired gun. If you're an entrepreneur, I'd say let your own voice show through. Let your personality shine through. I'll never forget, I don't know, this might have been a New York thing, but I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, back in the 70s and 80s, thereabouts, there was uh, an ice cream man named Tom Carvel. Uh, had you heard of him mm -hmm. out in Chicago? No, out in no. Atlanta. Hey, so it must have been a local thing. Uh, he had this raspy voice. He was a, a Greek immigrant, I think, and he used to do his own commercials. And I thought, Gee, what? No, at first I thought, gosh, he's like his own worst average. But then <laughs> it, it, the, the, the commercials became compelling. And I thought, you know, this guy's really kind of endearing. You know, he's like an uncle, you know. And it, he was using his own voice, very sincere, and it, it worked. You know, I mean, those, those campaigns were around for, for, for years. Uh, so it, there's a good example of, you know, if, if you have your own company, you know, no matter who you are, whether you're a PhD or you, you've never been to college, you, you know, use your own voice and it'll it'll work for you. Don't be behind a big company facade. Just kinda... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Don't sound institutional. I think that that's a mistake a, a lot of uh, entrepreneurs yeah. make. Yeah. You, you want to differentiate your, your voice. Rick, I have uh, one last question. I appreciate your time. But before oh, sure. I ask... Tell people where they can find you online, what they should check out. Okay, well, for my advertising services, my copywriting, uh, go to richardbayon.com. Um, it's you know, it's sort of a rudimentary site. It's, it's like my business card in, in, in cyberspace, but you can find out about my advertising and copywriting services there. Uh, I also write a, a political blog. That's one one of my uh, missions. I don't make any money from it, but it, it's something I felt I'd do because this country is just being torn apart by the polarization. I mean, my gosh, it's like we're we're devolving in, into into two separate countries, you know, left and right. And so, yes, the new moderate. I'm trying to. <laughs> 
not only criticize the extremists, but you know, try and find common ground that, that, that people can agree on. I don't know what, what impact I'm having, but I'm doing my best. I think I, there was an article about like why let ISIS have all the fun or something. What, what was that one? Well, why, why let the extremists have, extremists why, why all, the the extremists have all the fun? Yeah, right. right. Yeah, yeah. And it, it occurred to me about halfway through that maybe they're really not having such fun. They're, they're definitely dominating the news. Uh, they're dominating the, the, the message boards online. Oh, I mean, some of the message boards that I see, it's just, you know, it's, it's really like, like the Civil War all over again, 150 years later. But then I thought, are they really having fun? They all seem so angry. You know, the, the, the left-wingers seem angry, the right-wingers seem angry, and neither branch seems to regard itself as being American, you know, that they're, they're, it's almost like we're splitting up into little mini nations, uh, especially with, with all the, the identity politics on the left, and then you have the, you know, the Tea Partiers on the right, and uh, I, I think, you know, we just need to find common ground again. What made you decide to start that? Uh, let's see, I started it around 2007, it was during the Bush administration, the second Bush administration, and yeah, Bush was a polarizing figure. Uh, then you had you know what they called Bush derangement syndrome. Uh, you know the the liberals were all going a little nutty because uh, you know they, they'd start mocking his grammar and everything. And uh, uh, yeah, and then uh, once Obama was elected, it shifted to the other side. You had all this hysteria on on, on the right. You know the, the Tea Party faction emerged, uh, and so yeah, it just that that kept me going. So what what do you what kind of stuff do you publish lately on the New Moderate? Uh, well, yeah, there was the one about the extremists having all the fun. The, the latest one was about that shooting down in uh, North Charleston and mm -hmm. yeah, how, yeah, I mean, it was a, a tragedy, but there were mistakes made on both sides and it, it's also a mistake to frame it as a racial incident because, yeah, it seems like the, the only cases we hear about on the news are where, you know, white cops kill black men and that it's, that's just not so that, you know, there are, I think, twice as many whites being killed by cops. Uh, I mean, not, not to take away from, you know, what the black community is going through, but it, you know, we don't want that distortion coming across on the news, which, which will only fuel anger and, and, and race hatred. Yeah. It's, it's totally nonproductive. Yeah. So my last question is, what are you working on lately that you're excited about? Uh, getting my second collection of essays together. Uh, this will be the a, dark a chocolate. Theme. Yeah. After dark chocolates, uh, this one will be more like news stories, not not really news stories, but yeah, more like Mencken-esque commentary from the turn of the century. And I think it's enlightening because, you know, the 90s I think of as like the last happy decade. It was the, the golden age of yuppiedom, Seinfeld, uh, Friends, you know. It was kind of a happy time. And then all of a sudden, you know, 2000 comes along. We have the dot-com crash, 9-11, uh, the Bush presidency, the war in Iraq. And these essays I wrote just, just by coincidence straddled that transition. And I think it makes, you can, you can see the progression, you know, from the kind of, you know, loopiness of, of the 90s to the darkness of the early uh, 21st century. I'm, I'm going to call it Lifestyles of the Doomed. <laughs> so it won't be there, like... There'll be a picture of the Titanic on the cover. <laughs> um, so are you done with it? No, I'm not done with it. I'm about halfway through. Okay. Uh, but basically, it's, it's an editing job. I uh, you know, want to kind of you know, weed out some of the lesser essays and write little introductions to, to yeah. most of them yeah. to kind of set them in, in context. Rick, so, I appreciate uh, it. That'll be a fun project. <laughs> this has been fantastic. Everyone should check out your site. Check out Words That Sell and, and much more. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. It was fun. <laughs> Thank you.